Good afternoon to everybody. I'm Al Borgarts. I'm the Deputy Provost here at Army University. Uh, it's great to see an absolutely full house here, uh, and we welcome the outstations also um, for a very uh, timely topic that we'll, uh, we'll hit today. So on behalf of uh, Major General uh, Stephen Moranian, the uh, Deputy Commanding General CAC for Education, uh, he couldn't be here today, so he sends his regrets, but on behalf of him, we welcome you uh, to Army University and to this forum. Um, so the CASO, the Culture and Area Studies Office, uh, Dr. Rai, uh, has teamed up uh, to present a very topical uh, uh, target uh, for today, and uh, we appreciate everybody attending. And we do ask that if you uh, uh, are going to talk or speak, please move to a microphone uh, when, we, uh, when we get to that uh, section of the question and answer. So we'll be uh, conducting today's panel discussion um, on the, um, the cultural dynamics of U.S.-Iran relations and then is conflict imminent? Very timely, as I said already. Um, so I want to welcome our uh, panel members today. Uh, clearly, our military forces need to be uh, kept abreast more than ever and prepared to effectively operate uh, with multinational and uh, partner nations. Um, certainly, um, in this area of the world, it's very busy. So it, the CASO mission, as we have it here, uh, to work with our partners and to, to talk about culture is very important. So we welcome the opportunity uh, for full spectrum op uh, options to talk about uh, what we can do. And uh, certainly in the future, we'll continue to lean forward on large scale combat operations of focus uh, here at CGSC. So today, uh, I want to welcome our three panel members. Uh, first, Mr. Chris uh, Hoke. He joined the Office of the Director of National Intelligence as a National Intelligence Officer for Iran in March of 2019. He's got over 22 years of experience focusing on Iranian domestic, foreign, and regional policies. Uh, he served three overseas tours with the Department of State, including uh, Jordan, uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, and in Dubai. Also, the UAE from 2002 to 2004, so varied experience in the region, so we welcome you. He has an MA in Middle East Comparative Politics from the American University in Washington, D.C., awarded in 1999, and a B.S. in Political Science from Florida State University, awarded in 1996. Sir, welcome. Next, we have Dr. Michael Rubin. He's a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., and a senior lecturer at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Uh, he's worked as a staff advisor for Iran and Iraq uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon. He received a B.S. degree in biology from Yale University in 1994 and a Ph.D. in history from the same institution in 1999. He's previously worked as a lecturer in Iranian history at Yale, Johns Hopkins in Washington, D.C., and at three other uh, universities in northern Iraq, actually. He's lived uh, and conducted research in Yemen, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, he's the author of multiple books and other publications, so sir, welcome. Finally, we have Mr. Brian Steed, an assistant professor here at uh, Commander General Staff College, a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel with more than 30 years of both civilian and uniformed experience. As an Army officer, he served in the Middle East as a foreign area officer, which required him to travel extensively throughout the, the region and North Africa. It included uh, eight and a half consecutive years living and working in the Middle East. He was both an officer in the Jordanian Armed Forces and a liaison to the Israel, the Israel Defense Forces. Brian's written uh, a number of books and edited them and numerous articles and papers on military theory, history, and cultural awareness. So welcome, Brian. Hopefully most of you already know Dr. Rye, but I'll go ahead and introduce him. He is the head of the CASO office here. He asked me to stick to Dr. Rye, so that's what I'll do. It makes it easy for everybody. So we're going to keep to a, a relatively tight time schedule, given the number of people here. 
Again, we appreciate your involvement and your discussion as we get to the question phase. Uh, this target audience, uh, we've got a number of outstations. I want to remind the outstations that you are invited to also ask questions, so please let us know uh, uh, when you have one. I do want to point out that these opinions and discussions are uh, those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent official positions of the U.S. government. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. I, and he'll continue to moderation throughout the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your support. How's everybody today? Are you ready for an exciting discussion? I can feel a lot of energy, action. OK. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for our quarterly session and discussion. Next slide, please. Similar to our previous panels, CASO's approach is usually twofold. What we do? First, as a result of careful analysis of the operational environment, we identified the most important topic at that particular time for our national security. Is it important topic today? OK. And secondly, to invite the best talents across the nation in their respective areas of expertise in support of your missions. Does that make sense? OK. Given the recent developments, Needless to say that today's topic is very relevant. Before setting the stage for the session, I would like to share information on how you can access CASO capabilities. Next slide, please. This public domain CASO page can be accessed simply by typing CGSC CASO on your browser. This is an incomplete list of organizations which are current active partners of CASO. You can see more, that's why it says more, on actual website. And the network of our contacts are, is steadily expanding across the nation and beyond. If you click on CASO logo in the middle of the page, it will get you to the next page. Next slide, please. On this page, you can see CASO's mission and vision statement. Click on the second link. Next slide, please. You can access related information for the today's session on the conferences, seminars, and forums right here, among other previous events, within about one week after the panel. OK? To set the stage, we would like to share a short video which provides the main historical perspectives to a certain extent explaining the current state of US-Iran relations. I would like to emphasize that we do not support any possible political views or biases which the video might contain. We are not politicians here, we are scholars, right? Okay, so rather, just to share the historical facts for the purpose of follow-on scholarly discussion. Does that make sense so far? Or it doesn't make any sense? It does? OK. Please, let's play the video at this time. President Trump has long been fixated on Iran. But recently, he's turned things up a notch. We're going to be sending a relatively small number of troops. We have one of the most powerful ships in the world that's loaded up, and we don't want to have to do anything. It's going to be a bad problem for Iran if something happens, I can tell you that. Trump and the president of Iran have been engaged in a war of words, leading to some pretty dramatic headlines. Tonight, a major escalation between the U.S. and Iran. The drumbeat of war is growing louder from the White House. But to understand how we got here and why things have gotten so tense so quickly, we have to rewind to the 1950s. In 1953, British and American intelligence agents orchestrated a plot to oust Iran's democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, and restore the autocratic king, the Shah, to power. Poor royalist mobs roamed the streets battling Mossadegh's forces to a standstill. Mossadegh had nationalized the country's oil industry, which had previously been controlled by the British for almost 50 years. 
The young Shah, on the other hand, was much more willing to bend to Western interests. That mob that came into North Tehran and was decisive in the overthrow was a mercenary mob, it had no ideology. And that mob was paid for by American dollars. And it was the United States only a few years later that helped Iran set up its first nuclear technology. Fast forward to 1979, when protests led by nationalists and leftists, and later co-opted by the religious right, filled the streets of Tehran. After months of demonstrations, the U.S.-backed Shah fled the country, and religious leader Ayatollah Khomeini declared Iran an Islamic Republic, pushing out nationalists and left-wing allies in favor of anti-American conservative social values. In November that same year, a group of students stormed and occupied the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, taking more than 50 Americans hostage for over a year. The United States cut ties and then went on to back Iraq after it invaded Iran, which led to a bloody eight-year war that involved chemical weapons and left nearly a million people dead. It was the bloodiest confrontation in the history of the Middle East. Both the revolution and the hostage crisis are seen as a direct response to American interference in Iranian affairs and would go on to set the tone for relations between the two countries for decades. This picture tells it all. Then in 1983, President Ronald Reagan labeled Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism after a suicide bomber targeted a U.S. military base in Beirut, killing 241 American troops. The truck was packed with more than 500 pounds of TNT. Three years later, while Iran and Iraq were still at war, the Reagan administration was caught selling weapons to Iran and using the money to fund rebels in Nicaragua, violating both the government's own policy of not negotiating with terrorists and a series of laws designed to prevent American support of the Contras. This was a mistake. Then you have Iran Air Flight 655. In 1988, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq war, a U.S. naval ship mistakenly shot down an Iranian passenger plane, killing all 290 people on board. The U.S. has always said it was an accident, but many Iranians don't believe that. Things started to get better in the late 90s, but it didn't last. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. When the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, it further complicated the power struggle between Iran and its regional rival, Saudi Arabia. Then in 2005, Iran elected a new controversial leader. During his time in office, tensions over Iran's nuclear program hit an all-time high. The international community feared that Tehran was working towards developing a nuclear weapon, so they imposed harsh sanctions that crippled Iran's economy. Despite that, Iran has continued to be locked in a proxy war with Saudi Arabia, backing various militias across the Middle East. Fast forward to 2013, when moderate Hassan Rouhani came to power on the promise that he'd revive the country's weakened economy. To do that, he needed sanctions lifted, so right after his election, he resumed negotiations with the US and other world powers on Iran's nuclear program. Obama even called Rouhani the highest level of contact between the two countries since 1979. That set the groundwork for the Iran nuclear deal, signed in 2015 between Iran and the U.S. and five other world powers. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a historic moment, but then 2016 happened. The United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Since Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, things have taken a turn for the worst. And Trump is surrounded by advisors who are staunchly anti-Iran. But even though both leaders have ramped up their military posturing, most experts agree that a conflict is unlikely. Of course, it's hard to say what both leaders will do next. But if history is any indication, neither Iran or the United States want yet another war in the Middle East. So the slide, please. <clears throat> As a follow-up on the video, this slide summarizes the major sequence of events in the bilateral relations, including the recent developments, which mostly unfolded between January the 3 in the new year, 2020, and January 8. So we can discuss those points if you would have questions during the questions and answers period.
So this is kind of the summary. The initial remarks by the speakers for about 10, 12 minutes will be followed by questions, answers, and comments session from the audience for the rest of the time, including from outstations links through VTC. I believe my information, we have more than 10 outstations across the force. Next slide, please. Guess what? Without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Mr. Chris Hawke, who will discuss the major cultural disconnects between the US and Iran, which to a certain extent explain the current state of relationships between the two countries. Mr. Hawke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahimov. Uh, thank you very much to the Commander General Staff College for the invitation today. Um, it's a pleasure uh, as NIO for Iran for much of the last year. Um, speaking with you today is, is a pleasure because otherwise I would probably be in front of Congress. Uh, this is a much more forgiving forum uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I'd like to take the next 10 to 12 minutes to just kind of march through three kind of, uh, kind of macro points to you. Uh, and I'll spend a, probably a little bit more time on the first two than the third. But the first one is, uh, and you, you picked this up from the video, is that the context with Iran matters, uh, particularly in the case of the US. And the context in this case uh, translates into culture, how we perceive and misperceive each other, how we communicate and miscommunicate. And I think uh, the last 41 years uh, between the United States and, our, and the Islamic Republic are kind of replete with examples where we have missed opportunities, uh, we have uh, miscommunicated our intentions, and I think that's uh, very relevant uh, in, the, in the wake of the 2 January strike that killed uh, IRGC Quds Force General Soleimani uh, and kind of Iran's response to that against obviously US forces and locations in Iraq. Um, which I'm sure we can get to more in the question and answer. Uh, the second point I'd like to leave with, with today, and I think this is particularly important with Iran, or particularly important with any state uh, that we're dealing with, is we have to understand kind of who in Iran we're talking to. Uh, I'd argue, and I'll argue in my presentation, we're dealing with three uh, generations that really matter in Iran. And I'll kind of scope each of those out for you. But they all have kind of different ways of looking at us, uh, different ways of wanting to interact with the world in the United States. Uh, and that kind of matters about how we message them or how we uh, message our intent uh, to them. Uh, the third one, I think, uh, you know, the speakers to my right will kind of frame this a little bit more, uh, more clearly than I would, is just start to sketch out for you essentially kind of the, the threat or the opportunity we face with Iran currently. So, uh, so with that, I'll kind of launch into, into kind of the first, uh, first segment of my presentation. Um, does anyone here know who Howard Conklin Baskerville is? Um, I'll take from the lack of the show of hands and no one does. Um, uh, he was born in North Platte, Nebraska, 404 miles uh, from uh, Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Uh, he is buried, though, in a graveyard in Tabriz, Iran. Uh, he is considered the American Lafayette of the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. Uh, he raised a company of volunteers to go fight for democracy in Iran in 1909. Um, and I just want you to hold that uh, reflection in kind of your mind as we jump forward 70 years to the Islamic Revolution, a, a very different view of the United States in that context. Um, hostages held for 444 days, a complete rejection of uh, the association of Iran with the United States. Uh, they came to see us, and again, my colleagues will talk to this more at length, uh, as kind of a colonialist, imperialist power, uh, kind of suppressing an Iranian will or drive towards freedom. Um, we can discuss the merits of that and kind of how that is a, percep uh, you know, a correct perception or a misperception. Um, but I'd like you to hold those kind of two varying uh, uh, sense senses of uh, you know, Iran's relationship with the U.S. and vice versa, uh, essentially in your head, because I think it relates very well to a quote by Henry Kissinger, uh, who said uh, several years ago, you know, you know, what is Iran? Is it deciding between itself as a cause, a revolutionary cause, or actually a, a nation state that can interact normally with others? And I think that's as true in 1979 in the struggle with which Iran was facing at that time, and is true in uh, you know, January 23rd, uh, 2020. Uh, so that's kind of the paradigm, essentially, in which we're dealing with. Uh, slide one, please. Thank you. I thought a novel way to kind of uh, you know, deconstruct Iranian society in a way would be to kind of look at this through political cartoons, uh, in a way. Um, and I'll draw your attention to the first, uh, first cartoon and the one on my right uh, as kind of representative of kind of the revolutionary generation. That, that generation that came to power in Iran became a political age in the 1960s and 70s and then continues to rule and hold power in Iran today. Uh, a lot of these uh, gentlemen haven't gone anywhere. Khomeini has died, Rafsanjani has died, but Khamenei, uh, 
uh, the current Supreme Leader of Iran still remains, and as do a lot of his cohorts still within in the bureaucracy. Um, you know, being born in 1974, you know, seeing Iran as a, a terrorist state is something I grew up with. It's kind of, you know, until I dived deep on the subject, it's kind of how I perceived the, the Iranians to act, uh, to believe, and to behave. Um, I've been educated over the last 22 years. It is a much more complex problem uh, than that. Um, so to sum up the, to kind of sum up this generation, it was a, a generation that wanted to do away with all things West. It shuttered universities. It taught uh, kind of liberal social sciences from the West. Uh, it uh, ruthlessly kind of uh, dis disregarded and kicked out of the country, if not executed outright, uh, some of its political opponents. Uh, yeah, and really narrowed the political spectrum to a very traditional and conservative uh, political base. Um, if we jump forward to kind of the middle cartoon, um, can't forget that Iran is both a republic, uh, but also an Islamic republic. It kind of has those dual personalities. The ballot box has sometimes mattered in Iran, and kind of how it's charted a different course. Uh, there is a, a healthy debate in Iran about what type of country it should be. Uh, but there is always a kind of a growing suspicion, if you will, of you know what is the United States' intention, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Is it to upset their choice of the ballot box? Is it to uh, pursue regime change, uh, which I think is a big question in the Iranians' mind, uh, currently under under the current U.S. administration, but under several previous U.S. administrations uh, as well. Uh, but in this kind of you know era of reform, this second generation of Iranians that we're talking about, they took to the ballot box, as you saw in the video in 1997, and and essentially elected a reformist, someone who wanted to make changes within the character of the Islamic Republic. So for a period of years, you had a flourishing of a freer press, freer speech, um, you know, a wider range of debate. Some social restrictions were relaxed against women and minorities. Um, and that, that vein of, of, of thought and kind of a, a century politics still exists in, in Iran today. Uh, but if we kind of look to the, the third slide, um, you know, there was a backlash essentially against the reform movement starting in 2005, and I think it is still kind of uh, healthy uh, within the Iranian mindset today. It's marked by the election of President Ahmadinejad, uh, 2005 to 2013, uh, but really saw kind of a, a reassertion of kind of a conservative and very traditional mindset, uh, very suspicious of the U.S., and much bolder against the U.S. in a way, and that's, a, that's kind of a theme uh, that we'll return to. Um, so in a way, where does that kind of a uh, you know, quick sketch of the Iranian society kind of leave us if we're kind of dealing with the Iran of today? Um, uh, second slide, please. And I think this kind of captures the Iranian mindset uh, in a unique way. And I'll start with the cartoon on my left. Um, if you believe Iranian rhetoric, they are driving <coughs> slowly but surely the U.S. out of the region. Um, look at the you know, current events in Iraq, and that, that is still a very real goal for the Iranians. Um, they have a much more capable military than they did in the 1980s uh, in a much different configuration. Um, but they are prepared, uh, if we can take recent events, for example, to essentially have a conflict with us, which I think is a very different mindset than when we look at Iran, uh, particularly in the 1980s and even through the 1990s. Um, the second slide, the one to my right, um, would also suggest the futility, I think, which also exists in the Iranian mindset of going to war with the United States. Um, you know, again, here it's uh, maybe disparaging to the Iranian military in a way. Um, you know, it's not meant to be so, but it, they realize, I think, when I look at their rhetoric, the, the scope of the fight that that would entail and the cost that that would entail to, to the Islamic Republic and its future. Uh, it is a, not a fair and balanced uh, you know, kind of way of war, uh, again, which my colleagues can speak more to. Um, but again, that kind of dual personality and that dual mindset does exist within the Iranian psyche. Um, so again, if we're kind of looking at the scope of history and kind of where Iran is now, it is known as an Islamic Republic, a revolutionary state, but that kind of Islamic ideology has faded uh, in, in a lot of ways. And what it's been replaced with essentially is um, you know, a renewed nationalism uh, in Iran. And that nationalism, as you know, kind of embodied by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, a wing of its military, uh, when it's combined with kind of some of the capabilities that Iran has developed, and which we've seen kind of play out in the region, uh, particularly in the last seven, eight years, vis-a-vis uh, -vis U.S. forces in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, ballistic missiles, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, a more robust air defense, uh, and the dissemination and kind of support that they give to proxy groups, 
uh, ranging from Lebanese Hezbollah to the Houthis in Yemen to various Iraqi Shia militia groups. Um, you juxtapose an IRGC, which uh, you know, it kind of carries the nationalist flag to battlefields in places like Iraq and Syria. Uh, but you juxtapose that with a society that is increasingly connected to the outside world via the internet, uh, that is pushing for social change, uh, you know, women's rights, uh, you know, and kind of more of a voice uh, in that. Um, so there is a, a frailty, I think, that uh, many of us in the West see as, as an Iranian weakness. Um, I think we misread kind of the power of the regime, though, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, I would not discount uh, essentially their power to uh, essentially to hold on to authority. Uh, there are supporters, uh, many alive and well, in the Islamic Republic. Um, and I'll just end with kind of a, a few comments on, uh, I think, some really good numbers that came out of some University of Maryland polling that was published in November of 2019. 80% um, you know, of Iranians express negative attitudes towards the, towards the United States right now. That's probably the lowest it's been in 13 years. Uh, there was an 80% po uh, popular approval rating for General Soleimani, who we just killed. You know, how, how does that play out, or how does that reverberate in Iranian society? Uh, most Iranians support the ballistic missile program. Uh, again, strong majorities of Iranians support Iranian activities in Syria and Iraq. They, can, they will quibble and they will give you a good argument of the debate about kind of the expenditures of the Islamic Republic in those locations. But for them, it's, a, it's a, not really a choice to go fight ISIS outside of their borders uh, versus like letting them in the, in the border and trying to fight an internal battle. Um, I'll stop my comments there. I'll turn it back to Dr. Ibrahimov, uh, but I hope that kind of sketches out some of the problems that we're dealing with in Iran, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hawk, for the great presentation. <laughs> next slide, please. The next speaker is Dr. Michael Rubin, who will tackle sociocultural, demographic, and economic aspects of the relations between the U.S. and Iran. Dr. Rubin, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the CGSC and CASO. I also need to thank the Foreign Military Studies Office here, uh, which sponsors a good deal of my research and including my trip out here today. Um, I'm a historian by training, which means I get paid to predict the past. Ultimately, many of my detractors would say I get that right only about half the time. But today what I want to do is see how the past is precedent when we look at uh, Iran and the potential for conflict in the future. Is conflict imminent? One of those issues which I want to discuss, I used to say in a crowd like this I wanted to talk about demography, but everyone's eyes would glaze over. So for the next minute or so I'm going to talk about sex in Iran. One of the key things to understand, we often talk about youth bulges and so forth, but because the big family campaign ended during the 1980s because of all the economic strains. And you had a birth control campaign. Iran has had one of the most drastic declines in birth rates in the modern era. The birth rate today is half of what it was in the 1980s. Now, this has led to a cognizance among the Iranian leadership, and if you look at the Revolutionary Guard Corps' own newspapers, about what it means to have an aging population. The Revolutionary Guard thinks that this is going to make security easier because there's going to be fewer and fewer 20-somethings proportionately to, to run roughshod and have their youthful passions and so forth. But the problem is, as the popula population ages, What's going to be the economic reverberations of that? For the same reasons, I'm less afraid of the rise of China than I am for the fall of China, simply because of decades of one-child policy has put China on uh, a trajectory for a demographic, demographic precipice. And you've had the supreme leader make three or four speeches in, uh, in Iran about the demographic challenges Iran faces and what it means, urging some people to have more children and so forth. The point is, if you get a situation where you have an aging population and economic challenges that that incurs, will Iran try to rally people around the flag to sort of distract them with nationalism the way arguably Vladimir Putin does when it comes to Georgia, Ukraine, or elsewhere? So that's one aspect I worry about. Now, oftentimes we talk about regime change as if everything is decided in Washington. We're very, uh, we, we like to navel gaze, especially in Washington. 
I would argue that regime change is coming to Iran and it's going to have nothing to do with the United States. The simple fact is Ayatollahs live a long life, but they do eventually die. And as Mr. Hoke said, we've had transitions. Khomeini died in 89. Rafsanjani died a couple years ago. Shahrudi died. This old revolutionary class. But Ali Khamenei is 80 years old. He's had cancer and publicly acknowledged it. He's partially paralyzed from an old assassination attempt. And the fact of the matter is that we have to start thinking about how transition is going to work in Iran. And the key question here is whether there will be a smooth transition in Iran. I mean, for example, when Sultan Qaboos recently died, there was, they chose a successor within about a day, but they had two days to do it. What the Omanis point out to me is if you look at the constitutional path inside Iran, everyone says you go to the assembly of experts, but there's no time frame on that. So what happens if you start the process, but it never ends? Could the Revolutionary Guard, this is the worst case scenario for me, could the Revolutionary Guard assume power? If you do have a vacuum of leadership, would the Revolutionary Guard concentrate in Tehran, which is normal at periods of transition, but then if we look at Iranian history, whenever there has been a weak central government or a concentration of power inside Tehran, then you have une um, unease and instability along the periphery, in the Kurdish areas, in Iranian Azerbaijan, in Baluchistan, and so forth. And when we look at the neighborhood, think of all the regional states. It's not just us and the Iranians in the sandbox. Think of all the regional states that might interfere. Could the United Arab Emirates take the opportunity of chaos in Tehran in order to take back the islands, the disputed islands? Could you have problems in Iraqi Kurdistan? The Iranians already blame the United States and Saudi Arabia for what goes on in Khuzestan or Arabistan, as they call it. And they blame the United States and Pakistan for what goes on in Baluchistan, where outside of the Western media, there's been a number of incidents involving kidnapping of Revolutionary Guardsmen and so forth. Um, we often talk about what we know about Iran. I want to concentrate on what we don't know about Iran for a second. For example, Iran, the Iran-Iraq war was a formative event, but we don't know who served with whom in the, in the trenches, so who the informal networks of battle buddies are. Then in 2007, you had an organization of the Revolutionary Guard when they realized the big challenge would be internal. So they put one guard unit in every province. We don't know whether the members of those um, units are native to the provinces in which they serve, which indicates, if you follow it through, whether ideology trumps kinship if given the order to fire on the crowds in the street. Other things we don't know. We always talk about hardliners and reformers, and I certainly disagree with the video in depicting Hassan Rouhani as a reformer. But what, uh, do we have the same degree of insight into the factional divisions within the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps? How, I mean, and so given their resources, given what they call Khatam al-Anbiya, which is the economic wing, which basically has 90% of, I mean, they only get about 10% of their budget from the parliamentary process. Given that they're financially independent, how ideological are, are the IRGC? Are we going to be dealing with another Sisi, with the stringent nationalism uh, and military dictatorship? Or are we going to have that ideological drive which I would argue has led to the destabilization and what the Iranians would call export of revolution, which has led us into conflict in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, and so forth. Now, even if you got a best case scenario and the IRGC does not emerge paramount, if you have some sort of transition away from the Ayatollahs even, because remember, the only reason Khamenei was a compromise figure. And the reason people didn't dispute him is A, they thought he was weak and pliable, and B, because Khomeini, who had real religious credentials, pointed to him and said, that's my guy. Khomeini doesn't have the same religious credentials, so it's not clear his endorsement's going to matter much. But if you do have some transition, I want to disabuse people of the notion that Iran is somehow pro-Western. And in this, uh, Mr. Hoke's citation of the University of Maryland study, I think, is apt. Iran has a near contiguous history going back 2,000 years. That means they also have their own intellectual history. If we look at what Iranians were reading and the popular intellectuals up until in the decades before the Islamic Revolution, we see people like Ali Shariati who was trying to merge Islamism with leftism. 
We see people like Jalal Ali Ahmed, who wrote a famous book, Garbzadegi, which is often translated into West Toxification. It's sort of like the Shiite version of the Muslim Brotherhood, where we would be better if we just strip all the Western influence away from us. And basically, I would argue that a moderate by Iranian standards would be someone like Noam Chomsky. And so we're going to have a fierce xenophobic leftism, which is still going to be problematic within the region, because the problems didn't just start with the Islamic Revolution. You had the Persian-Arab conflict as well, and Iran's ambitions to, be, to basically restore the influence they once had. <coughs> I would just note, in conclusion, when we look at the past several American administrations, they tend to be defined on the national security and defense side. Their legacies are by problems they never saw coming. So for example, George H.W. Bush never expected to be in Iraq and Kuwait. Bill Clinton never expected to be in the Balkans. Uh, George, H., uh, George W. Bush campaigned on domestic stuff and then got in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Barack Obama castigated that and said, I want to end quote unquote stupid wars. And not only were we still in Iraq and Afghanistan, but then we were in Syria and Libya. The point of this is, instead of looking at Iran as it is now, I think we need to look at Iran as it will be in the future. During q and I'll also talk about some of the problems of transitions with Qasem Soleimani, with changes in the leadership of the IRGC, the IRGC Navy, the Iranian Navy, and the dynamics that that could lead to in precipitating conflict. But with that, let me conclude and turn the, the podium back to um, Dr. Ibrahim, Ibrahimov. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rubin, for another very interesting presentation. Next slide, please. So at this time, uh, Mr. Brian Steed will focus on how to use the information in bilateral U.S.-Iran relations for what? In support of your missions. Mr. Steed, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I see a lot of students out there, and uh, I'm sure you're thinking you're getting extra credit, so good for you. <laughs> extra credit for everybody. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the things I want to uh, caveat all these comments with is a, a lot of what I'm going to say applies more to the regime and regime leadership than necessarily the Iranian people. Uh, I have a good friend uh, who travels to Iran uh, quite regularly, and when she and I talk, she quite often challenges the notions because that's not her experience as she talks to regular Iranians. And I think that there is some difference uh, in perspective, but obviously our focus is on the Iranian government and, and the po people who make policy. So next slide, please. Uh, I want to start with this quote from uh, the recently published DIA assessment uh, and how they look at Iran as a threat. So I'm going to take a few moments to talk a little bit of history uh, and then several points that I'll bring up uh, more than once. So the, the first thing is to recognize where Iran's military actually begins, Iran's modern military. Uh, obviously, it begins before the Iran-Iraq War, but really where its character, where its identity is created is in the Iran-Iraq War. And certainly, the IRGC is definitely born in the Iran-Iraq War. And uh, the, this experience is one that we hardly ever study, and so we tend to be rather ignorant about it. Uh, in that war, Iran perceived itself to be alone against the world. It faced a technologically superior opponent. We don't recognize Iraq as a technologically superior opponent because when we fought them, we were the one that was technologically superior. But compared to Iran, and especially an Iran that was not getting uh, repair parts and ammunition from the United States to fix their US supplied equipment, Iran was always overmatched. And as a result, Iran sees itself 
as a force, as a military that will be overmatched in any conflict, which shapes how it views uh, and or how it views conflict in general and how it views its approach to the West. And it also sees that it's going to be technologically overmatched. Uh, so here I highlighted the word aiming. And so its aims get to this notion of raising costs so that they can achieve objectives. Okay, and this focus on niche capabilities. One that I will bring up over and over again is the fact that, well, first, they are fundamentally asymmetric uh, in almost everything they do. Not just asymmetric at a, at a tactical level, but asymmetric in how they perceive of war. Uh, and the primary way of this is proxies, which I'll touch on uh, more than once. They also perceive us to be weak-willed and technologically enabled, and in this sense, not in a positive sense, sort of enabled as crutches or a wheelchair might enable someone who is crippled. Okay, so they see us to be crippled, and technology helps us in, in overcoming our being crippled. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. So I sort of ap approach Iran from the region. Uh, I have not had the pleasure to go there. And so I look at it as I've experienced it from outside. And one of the things that I often think about, uh, and this is a, a statement that I heard more than once, but I heard it the first time when I was in Bahrain. And uh, it was explained to me that the Americans perceive of Iran as the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, and the region sees Iran as the Persian Empire. And Iran sees itself as the Persian Empire. And recognizing that difference, those of you who have been in Iraq recognize that in Arabic, the language is called Farsi, uh, and the people are often referred to as Farsiun, which literally means Persians. It's where we got the word. Uh, so everybody sees them as Persian, uh, except us. We tend to emphasize the Islamic Republic part. And we miss the fact that uh, empires have hegemonic interests. Persia is an empire. It has hegemonic interests and desires and desire to expand its influence. It also, in the modern world, empires also have nuclear weapons. Uh, and so for it to be a part of the imperial club, you kind of need to also be part of the nuclear club, which tends to lend it toward that. There are other reasons, but that is a motivation that tends to not be brought up. Now, our current Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, said previously when he was speaking at Kansas State University that, quote, Iran is a central problem causing instability in the Middle East, close quote. I've heard multiple figures also say something along the lines of, if you look at any place in the Middle East where there's a problem, you will find Iran. Okay, maybe true. But an Iranian official, I think, would say, if you look at any problem in the Middle East, you will find the United States of America. Also true. Okay, so when we say Iran's a troublemaker in the region, maybe true, but certainly from their perspective, and I would say not just Iranian, Iran's perspective, we are also a troublemaker in the region. And so when you have two troublemakers showing up, that's part of what leads to some of these conflicts. Uh, and then now I want, uh, next please. Uh, I want to emphasize again this asymmetric approach. So we talk often uh, about the major enemies of the United States being four plus one, or sometimes I've heard it said two plus two plus one kind of thing. But the emphasis is the plus one is the violent extremist organizations, or in this case, proxies. Now I would suggest to all of the students here who have their minds on large-scale combat operations, that any large-scale combat operation, I would argue any conflict at all, is always, it's going to be like a dinner party. There's always going to be a plus one. And in fact, most conflicts are just going to be the plus one. Uh, it's not going to be state on state. It's going to be a plus one. And if you're looking at Iran in particular, they are the experts at plus one warfare. Uh, and these proxies are just those in the immediate region. Uh, and they have other folks who operate and do uh, or conduct operations or, or expand their influence outside of the Middle East. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, 
so when you guys do the intelligence preparation of the battlefield, what we typically do is we mirror image. So we imagine what we would do given those capabilities on that terrain facing us as an opponent. And then we then come up with a course of action and say, okay, this is what the enemy would do. The problem with mirror imaging is when you do it, you don't actually see the enemy. You just see yourself or a reflection of yourself. And so with some opponents, that doesn't matter so much. Uh, and certainly in some cases, like as in World War II, it didn't matter so much if we truly understood the Japanese because we had a massive advantage with respect to aircraft and, and ships, which allowed us to do things irrespective of their culture. So mirror imaging was not the problem. But in today's world, where we are regularly resource constrained, then when we inaccurately mirror image, as all mirror imaging is, then we face uh, a significant problem. So I just want to go through a couple of ways that we can miss mirror image Iran. Uh, at a technical level, they already expect to be overmatched. So they're not seeking to technologically overmatch us. Okay, so that's a mistake. We seek that. That's one of our objectives. Uh, at a tactical level, they expect to fight alone. Now, they have more friends today in the world than they probably ever had in, in their post-revolutionary history, but they still expect to fight alone. We say that we're going to fight in coalitions, so we're wrong in that regard. Now, even though I said they say that they expect to fight alone, remember, it's alone plus one. Okay, so it's them with their proxies. They have no intent of going toe-to-toe -to -toe trading punches with the United States of America, with you. So if, if when you think of, will America and Iran go to war, and your image of going to war is Apollo Creed and Rocky Balboa in the ring for 15 rounds, then I would suggest you have the wrong image. Because in their mind, they're going to send a trainer or a janitor to break Rocky's kneecaps in the locker room, in the locker room, or maybe to put water on the floor so that Rocky slips and knocks his head and gets a concussion as he's walking to the ring, right? Like they have no intent of allowing you to walk in that ring at anything close to an equal footing, okay? So that is part of our problem. When we set up our scenarios, we imagine that we're both entering a ring and we're both going toe to toe. And that is not how they actually even consider the, the concept of how to fight us. Okay, they, they're going to do all sorts of other things before that would ever happen. Because uh, that would be failure in their minds if they allowed it to get to that point. Uh, and then the final point that I want to get at is uh, in this values aspect. They are an Islamist state. In, in many ways, they fulfilled the dream of the Muslim Brotherhood. They toppled an American puppet regime. They were able to create an Islamist state in the Middle East. This was successful. So in their sense, they are on God's side. And if you are on God's side, then you are going to win. So this isn't an issue of who's going to win or lose. This is an issue of just staying in the fight until God makes his will manifest. With that, Dr. Ibrahimov, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Steve, for another great presentation. Before the most fascinating stage begins, questions, answers, comments, just a quick point, that a uh, couple of points that, first of all, our panels always do a great job because our approach usually, we know our adversaries, right, global or regional. But why they're acting the way they, they're acting? So that's why we're trying to step in their shoes, understand their strategic culture or strategic military culture, and that's important. Why? In the case of Iran, for example, yes, uh, some people think that Iran is very unified. It's not really the case. Give me your examples that, you know, there is uh, three provinces uh, in the northern Iran around the city of Tabriz. 
the ethnic Azerbaijanis, uh, Azeris, they would call them Azeris because this is not the state, it's just the ethnicity. They are, represent a completely different ethnic cultural uh, family, which is the Turkic, compared to the Persian linguistic family or uh, ethnicity. So between 20, 30 million Azeris live in the three northern provinces of Iran, and it has a historical kind of reason for that. That was resulted uh, in 1824, 1828, the so-called Turkmenchai Gulistan agreements, uh, which uh, was the result of the multiple wars between the Persian Empire and the Russian Empire under the Catherine the Great or Catherine II, and resulted with that agreement to 20, 30 million Azeris in Iran and only 9 million in the former Soviet Azerbaijan, which as a result of those agreements became part of the Russian Empire and subsequently the Soviet Union. Now it's independent Republic of Azerbaijan. Why I said that? It's important to know there are internal kind of issues, including ethnic issues. By the way, the highest clerical uh, office held, guess by who? Ali Khamenei. He's ethnic Azeri. He's not Persian. He's ethnic Azeri. And I believe as a scholar, and my, uh, my first publication in the early 80s was as a result of the revolution in Iran, because it inspired me as a scholar to write about that in 82. So he uh, essentially, the reason for, I mean, we would be surprised why the non-Persian became the highest person uh, in the office in Iran. There were some tensions, some situations between the Persians and the second mi uh, majority, which is ethnic Azeris. So it's kind of, they were trying to work the, around that and make sure that the biggest uh, Azeri population is comfortable integrating them into the economy, et cetera, it's in political systems, et cetera. So uh, why I have said all these in support of the great panel? Because it's very important to the probably policy planners and policy makers to understand if there is an external, external threat, and a similar to Russian strategic military culture, then they will be unified. Whatever agenda it is, it could be likely during the f last 40 years, it was anti-American agenda. And uh, because of those sequence of events. Because of the Russian sociocultural historical uh, 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 considerations, because of the Russian strategic culture, very much similar. Tatar invasion, uh, Hitler invaded U Soviet Union, before that Napoleon, etc. So we need to keep that in mind. We need to step in the shoes of the adversary, understand that. So just a quick point. Now, the most, is that agreeable, uh, distinguished panel, what I said? Okay, so now the most important uh, uh, stage begins, right? Questions, comments, and answers. So uh, please, when you ask a question, Please use these microphones, because we are video recording. For those in the back seat, those two microphones, OK, very important, or whomever sits here, right? Based at least on one feedback uh, from the previous panel, uh, I want to emphasize that this floor, questions, comments, and answers, right? is available equally to, for this uh, audience as well as outstations. We have more than 10 outstations at least as of this morning. So they are welcome to chime in at any time, but just to make sure they understand they can do that, at some point I will pause for, for a minute to give them opportunity if they don't ask, if they would not start asking questions. Okay, now the floor is yours. Questions, comments. Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Dr. Ruben Craig Smith, uh, historian over at SAM, School of Advanced Military Studies. Um, so as a historian, uh, and you've laid out certain cultural aspects and you've talked about um, looking at what Iran will be not now, but in the future. So as a historian, how do you propose anticipating what Iran will look like 10, 20, 30 years from now based on your historic uh, research? Um, short answer. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. Short answer would just be, look, area studies experts have never successfully predicted a revolution. So I won't be so arrogant to say that I'd, I'd be the first. What I would say is that there are certain patterns in, in Iranian history, and perhaps the past is precedent. Whenever you have transitions, 
you tend to have um, discord and instability around the periphery. So I think that it's pretty safe to say if that occurred in the 1940s, if that occurred, um, so before that, if that occurred in the 1920s, if that occurred in the 1940s, if that occurred in the 1970s, that it's likely to occur now. And it seems that the regime itself believes that simply because they um, are, are it, it appears from their own internal debates that they are worried about the periphery. When it comes to um, issues with regard to the transition, it's something that while, well, put it this way, when I said that Khamenei acknowledged having cancer, he tweeted out pictures of himself being treated for cancer. And it was widely seen as preparing the public for the fact that there could be a transition to get that sort of conversation started. And when I talk to Iranians, um, I can no longer go back and forth to Iran, of course. But when I see them in Pakistan or elsewhere, um, it's oftentimes a subject of conversation. Certainly, it's a subject of conversation around the Gulf. But how might Iran look in the future? I don't know. I would say that we have to pay attention to intellectual history as, as, as well as political and diplomatic. And so that's where I'm trying to guess, do my guesswork on. Is that answers your question, sir? Oh, very, very much. Thank Excellent. You. Somebody had a question there. Please introduce yourself. Is it up? Brett. Okay. All right, uh, gentlemen, first off, thanks for coming here to talk to us today. Uh, Captain Michael Herbs, I'm a student here at CGSC. My question is kind of along the same line, so maybe the uh, answer might be similar, but more concerning the level of influence Iran will have in Iraq going forward. Obviously, in a post-Saddam world, they've had an increasing level of influence. Ten years from now, post Soleimani, what level of influence do you see Iran having in Iraq? Um, will it be a proxy state? Will it be a contentious relationship going forward? Thank you. Um, I spend a lot of time in Iraq. So, and also, I'm the least affiliated with government, so perhaps I'm the most free. Um, I have the greatest ability to speak freely. Um, I was down in Fao a couple years ago. That's where Iran, Iraq, and Kuwait all come together. Very Shiite area, exclusively Shiite area. And some of the fishermen down there said the biggest mistake the Americans made was not killing enough Iranians on the way out. Now, that's because all politics is local. At the same time, about a year and a half ago, there was a massive fish kill in uh, Iraq, in the Tigris River. And so you had thousands of fish floating dead in the Tigris River. And in all likelihood, it was caused by agricultural runoff. But the rumor spread across Iraq <coughs> that it was the Iranians who were deliberately poisoning Iraqi fish in order to get Iraqis to purchase Iranian products. When I talk to Shiites, and I, suppose, I spend most of my time uh, in Iraq in the south, um, including with the Hashd al-Shabi, which is the, um, the popular mobilization forces. Um, what I would argue is that, on one hand, the greatest complaint Iraqis have towards Iran is something we don't see on our radar screen. It's the dumping of cheap manufactured goods in the local economy in order to undercut Iraqis. All politics is economic and local. The point of this is there is a great deal of Iraqi nationalism. If Americans historically underestimate the psychological impact of occupation, the Iranians have a tendency to underestimate the impact of um, Iraqi nationalism or others' nationalism. They tend to um, smother Iraq. The Iraqis are furious, for example, that when the Iranians came in in 2003-2004, um, they immediately started killing veterans of Air Force veterans who had bombed Iran during the Iran-Iraq War. January 6 is still Iraq Army Day, and the Shiites celebrate it, and the Kurds celebrate it because they see the problem being Saddam Hussein, not being the institution of the Iraqi Army itself. Now, where the United States, I think, loses out in this is we all know the dime paradigm, the diplomatic, informational, military, and economic component. When it comes to the informational component, I would argue that the U.S. is so afraid of doing anything wrong that we end up doing nothing right and ceding the floor space. 
the basis of our influence operation is to be truthful under the idea that through truth we build credibility. The Iranians have a different, the problem with that is it can sometimes take three or four days to determine what the truth is, by which point the news cycle moves on. What the Iranians will do is throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And it may be absolutely ridiculous, but for example, when they say that, and I'm quoting Tabnak, which is a so-called moderate news agency in Iran that was affiliated with the former president Rafsanjani, that the American goal in Afghanistan is to turn Afghanistan into a new Andalusia um, and to Christianize the country, making an allusion to the expulsion of the Muslims from Spain and Portugal. Now, that may sound ridiculous, but if there's one contractor in Indiana who puts on bib biblical citation numbers on sniper scopes, that gets picked up in the media, amplified, you could have an Afghan farmer who said, I didn't believe this stuff before, but maybe there's something to it. Now, if the basis to our strategy is counterinsurgency, winning hearts and minds, all the Iranians have to do is throw a wrench in it, and if they can get something that happens kinetically, all the better. Now, the last point I would make on this is just one other anecdote. There, there's a cognitive dissonance in the, in the region. I will be asked, when I, once a year I go to the shrine of Imam Hussein as, a, um, as the guest of um, Grand Ayatollah Sistani's chief of staff. And there's Syrians there, there's Iranians there, there's Iraqi Shiite there, Lebanese Shiites, and they all say the Americans created the Islamic State. It's absolute nonsense, of course, but it's a widespread belief. What I will try to challenge them is how many times before President Obama started air operations in Syria, did the Iranian-backed Syrian Air Force bomb the Islamic State capital of Raqqa? The answer, I think, is zero or one. Most of the barrel bombs were in civilian populations. The point of this is, if we're willing to argue back, we can change the hearts and minds. Sorry, one last point I would say is that we make a mistake and we play into Iranian hands by looking at all the Shiite militias as exclusively under Iranian control. There is a difference between those Shiite militias under Iranian control and those who had just answered Sistani's call. When I would be in the Hasht al-Shabi camps, you'd have busloads of 15-year-old to 60-year-olds come off the bus. And I would be there watching some of the training. And there'd be a guy from Lebanese Hezbollah in the next guest house who was doing the same thing. What he was looking for is people who had military aptitude or ideological aptitude to try to fold into Qatayib Hezbollah, Asaib Ali al-Haq, or any of these specific Iranian-controlled militia groups. The other thing we need to watch out for is, I mean, the Kurds do this all the time, is, for example, saying the Shiite militias are in the north. We have to differentiate between militias where people are coming from across Iraq to join that militia versus, for example, around Tel Afar where it's more of a neighborhood watch and a lot of the Shiites are local. We can't antagonize the local Shiites who aren't under Iranian control for the sake of taking on the Iranians. We just have to, basically, it's a problem set we need to address, but I think it would be much more effective to address it with a scalpel than an ax. Yes, sir. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, I, I learned the very first time I went to Iraq, and. I didn't appreciate this going in because we always talk about Iraq's divisions as Sunni Shia Kurd, which of course are wrong because that's religious, religious, ethnic. And uh, the, the boss that I worked for the first time I was in Iraq primarily met with Sunnis. That was sort of his task is to understand Sunnis working in the MOD and some other places. So I was regularly in meetings with him. And while he was talking to the important people, us unimportant people would talk. And it was interesting to uh, get, kind of peel back how they saw it. And they saw it more often, uh, and of course these are Sunnis, but they more often saw it as an Arab-Persian split than a Sunni-Shia split. And they would make that distinction over and over again. Like, oh, well, he's Persian. And, and it's like, I'm thinking, well, and, and of course somebody would say, well, yeah, but he's been here for 80 years, or his family's been here for 80 years. And they're like, well, that's, you know, that may be a long time in America, but over here, that's nothing. And, and we don't appreciate that. So Muqtad al-Sadr, for example, is Shia, but he's Arab and very Iraqi. Uh, and, and we often don't make those distinctions because we kind of label all Shia as being sort of under Iran's uh, 
sway. And I would say, just in support of Dr. Rubin's point, I think the more important person with respect to uh, how the Iraqi Shia are going to behave is going to be when Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani dies and not necessarily Ali al-Khamenei because he has way more influence as a single person, an influencer, on the Shia living in the Middle East than any other single Shia. Uh, and so what happens, who replaces him? Is there a person that can replace him with respect to a similar level of gravitas? I think the question, th th that's highly debatable. I would look for that transition to be within a month if I had to put money on it. Because as many of you know, Sistani is 90 years old. He just had surgery for a broken femur. And when you talk to surgeons and physicians, this is just last week, it's usually a surgery from which 90-year-olds, they survive the surgery, but they die because of the complications. Um, and so I think this transition might happen a lot sooner than people are prepared for. Yeah, if I could just add one more comment, and I, I think I'll approach this from the, essentially the policy lens. Um, you know, th there's a thesis going out in academia and the think tank world about the natural limits of Iranian influence. And I think if you look at kind of the popular protest movement in Iraq uh, since October of last year um, in Lebanon and some other places, it would suggest maybe there is, is room where Iran has run up against those natural limits of nationalism, whether it be in Iraq, uh, you know, a, a viable kind of alternative for them, Sistani in, in many ways, in, in Najaf. So the succession process, I think, takes on renewed kind of emphasis there. But one from the policy perspective, I would also is, what is Iraq's alternative? If we're going to flip it around, uh, you know, which comes down to a level of U.S. military or diplomatic engagement in the region. You know, what are the other alternatives uh, you know, for the Iraqis or other states? Uh, Russia, Iran, uh, Turkey. Um, you know, you know, we have to decide you know, kind of collectively what our, our national and strategic objectives are there and, and to kind of reaffirm those uh, because I think the Iraqi leadership, the elite, if there's a new Iraqi leadership and elite that emerges, you know, they face those same choices about we, we need friends, we need allies. Yes, Iran is our neighbor, but do we have any alternative other than them you know, to kind of grow in that trajectory? So I think that's an important question going forward. Is that answers your question, sir? Yeah, By the way, real quick, uh, talking about the militias, which Dr. Rubin was elaborating, it could be unnoticed, but in the same USA strike, there was another guy killed. His name was Abu al-Muhandis, who was the leader of the so-called Al-Kataib Hezbollah, which is the kind of the Iraqi branch of the Hezbollah. As you know, many of you probably know that the, the highest uh, leader of that, Sheikh uh, Nasrullah. So, um, so we, we have to see if going to be any implications from the Iraqi perspective or Iraqi militia perspective. So, uh, by the way, before I forget, some of you have been doing the discussion kind of, most of you I'm sure know, I'm just trying to be diplomat, right? So, but there is a two, Khamenei and Khomeini. This is not the same person, okay? I want to make clear, Khamenei, Ayatollah Ruhale Khomeini, was the main guy who led the revolution in 1979, actually initially from Paris, and then he landed in Tehran, and millions of Iranians were kind of, I, I, I remember those images from TV, Soviet TVs. They were crying, yelling. He was very popular at the time. So, and then we have Ali Khamenei. So Khamenei died, obviously. Khamenei, currently the highest clerical uh, person in Iran. Does that make sense? I just wanted to, uh, clarify these simple things that we have on the, we are on the same page. So, other questions, other comments? Yes, sir. Gentlemen, oh, almost. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, Captain Kyle Litchfield, I'm a student here at CGSC. I'm wondering uh, for the panel, uh, how does civil unrest, both, both domestically in Iran and ongoing Iraq, factor in Iranian decision making? Thank you. I'll take a first swing at that one, sure. Um, uh, in part, I, I think I kind of addressed the question in Iraq. Um, you know, how much does Iranian influence, when it starts, I think, to seep out into the open, uh, when you have Iraqi Shia militias openly affiliated with Iran, you know, greeting Iranian leaders, um, you know, that incurs some backlash from, I think, the local population, the local elites. Um, you know, again, I think there's still a lot of room to play out of whether that is going to be a natural kind of break in Iraqi society for kind of the limits of Iranian influence going forward. Um, 
the debate around the prime minister and kind of the selection after uh, Adil Abdel Mahdi. If you're looking at the Iraqi political class, um, a lot of them have connections back to Iran. So are, are you just kind of recycling a, you know, a face who has kind of those still kind of either passive or overt connections back to, back to an Iran? Or if you kind of redo the entire political system, you know, we're kind of changing the paradigm. Um, you know, it makes this, you know, increases both the uncertainty for us, uh, you know, the U.S., the international community, but also for the Iranians. So there's, there's risk reward, I, I would say, in that. Um, internally, um, and I, I would go back to one of Dr. Rubin's points here, uh, particularly in the, if we look at the civil unrest um, in January, um, you know, essentially over the, the downing of the Ukrainian airliner uh, back in November over some uh, socioeconomic, uh, but also back in 2017, 2017, 2018, when there were some other riots oh. in Iran, a lot of these are socioeconomically driven, and it would suggest, um, at least when we look at it, that you know, the regime, you know, Khomeini has a great quote, that the Islamic Revolution was not about the price of watermelons. Well, the sustainment of the Islamic Republic may be about the price of watermelons, unfortunately, and kind of how the regime kind of delivers on the socioeconomic promise. Uh, if you remember after the video, Rouhani kind of campaigned on this, essentially, that he would rebuild these ties, you know, solve the nuclear issue, and kind of rebuild economic ties to the world. That just has not materialized for the Iranian population in a lot of ways. So I think that that is a challenge going forward. I would just reiterate a point from, from my own talk. Do not underestimate the ability of the regime to repress its own population. Its track record, um, while uneven at times over the course of its history, it is not shy about uh, essentially, you know, killing, executing, intimidating, jailing, uh, you know, members of its own population. Uh, roughly, you know, two to three hundred probably died in the November protests just a couple of months ago. Um, you know, they are willing to kind of go to extremes, and a, a regime born of a revolution which was actually fairly bloody uh, in its aftermath, uh, I think, is kind of taking those lessons to heart and kind of maintaining that that kind of iron grip at home. But I open it up to others. I, I just second what. Um Mr. Hulk said that never underestimate the ability of the regime to, um, to crack down. The two, two points I just want to make. One is, when it comes to Iraq, I think one of the relevant issues, which is very seldom discussed, is according to former Prime Minister Haider Abadi, 40% um, of Iraqis were born after the 2003 war. That means by 2030, you're going to have um, 50 million Iraqis. There are 24 million Iraqis at the time of the war. Now, what this is meant, and if we want to take this further, already more than 60% of Iraqis were born after the 1991 conflict. What this basically means is most Iraqis don't have any functional memory of political life under Saddam Hussein. And therefore, while immediately after Operation Iraqi Freedom, a lot of the Shia parties or the Kurdish nationalist parties or so forth could attract constituents and say, look, we know we're not perfect, but at least we're not Saddam Hussein. That doesn't have resonance anymore. And so you've got a situation where this leads into the protest movement in Iraq. One of the frustrations, however, and I was in Iraq, I was in West Mosul and Sinjar um, and in Baghdad in de December. And I was sitting in Baghdad with a very senior Iraqi leader. And we were talking about the, um, the protests. And basically the frustration is they kept trying to reach out to the protesters, but the protesters were refusing to organize to actually have a face for negotiations. What they want to do is what's common in the Middle East, which is we're going to come up with a list of criteria of what the new leader should be, but we're not going to actually suggest who should negotiate or whatever. And that simply doesn't work. One other point. And this segues into the previous question that I worry about. There seems to be a belief, and I would call it magical thinking, among some in the policy community right now, especially after the aftermath of the Qasem Soleimani killing. And full disclosure, I, I support the Qasem Soleimani killing. So you know where I'm coming from. But there seems to be a belief that, perhaps, and it's a belief which the Kurds are also pushing forward is perhaps we should just, Baghdad is lost, perhaps we should just retreat to Iraqi Kurdistan, maybe bring some of the Sunni communities in. And that sort of division, which is sort of like what Joe Biden suggested when he was a senator back in 2006, ultimately won't solve any of the problems. 
forget that you don't have any even divisions. But if you were to have a rump Iranian-dominated Iraqi state around Baghdad, what might Iran do in that state? And how might they use that state as a base to further instability towards the American Kurdish statelet, which would be completely landlocked, and so logistically I have no clue. But it, it raises some questions about, as you guys know the joke about the Russian optimist and the Russian pessimist? The Russian pessimist is the guy who says, you know, things are horrible. They've never been so bad. I mean, war, instability, lack of food, environment, all that. And the opti uh, they could never possibly get worse. And the Russian optimist is one who said, no, 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 they can always get worse. <laughs> so let me just be an optimist in this case. I didn't know that you speak Russian. <laughs> uh, well, you know what they say if you want to learn Russian. <laughs> my, my wife is a Soviet <laughs> refugee. Um, just a real quick to what uh, uh, Dr. Rubin uh, uh, greatly described about demography in Iraq. Um, by the way, it might be very important to mention, in Iran, about 70% is youth. And that's the result of eight-year war, Iraq-Iran war. After that, the Iranian leadership conducted some demographic policies. And right now, we have 70, around 70%. Can you define youth? Push back on this. To 20 years, 30 years? I mean, if it's 30 years, I would say it's not youth anymore. Then oh, you okay. have the bulge in for the me, middle. For me, youth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> for me, uh, from my perspective. Okay. <laughs> but, but thank you. That's, that's a very useful comment. But uh, why I mentioned that, that could be important talking about the future of Iran. Maybe some scholars say we don't have to do anything. This youth have certain mentality, and it will transition itself. It's just I, I read some, some opinions about that. The, the country, Iran, will transition itself naturally into the civilized or modern world, away from theology, et cetera, et cetera. So just, this is just two cents. Is there any, any other? Uh, I would say there's been some interesting research. What was the name of the author from SAIS? from Johns Hopkins? No, Nargis Baloji. Uh, Nargis Baloji, who wrote Iran Unveiled. She spent a couple years embedded with and researching as an anthropologist conservative media operations in Iran and had unique access. But she identified a lot of fissures which we normally don't see. For example, of the revolutionary generation who abided by Khomeini's call, volunteered for the Iran-Iraq war, joined the IRGC, you've got a division as they as they use their position to win rewards afterwards, to get political positions and so forth, they don't want their kids joining the revolution, the army or the IRGC. Because they said basically, why we sacrifice for this, why don't you go to medical school, why don't you go to law school sort of thing. And that division, one of the other divisions which she um, elaborated upon was of the revolutionary, the first revolutionary generation differences that are emerging between those that only had sons versus those that had daughters as they face the aspirations of their daughters, which might not necessarily um, coincide with the revolutionary values for which they fought in the early years of the Iran-Iraq war. Great. Is that answers your question, sir? Yeah. This answers? OK, great. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yes, sir, please. Introduce yourself. Ask your question. Shihada from Lebanon. I'm a student here. So my uh, question is about the ballistic missiles uh, for Iran. We know that Iran has invested too much in the ballistic missiles and still, and like many reasons, as cost effective, as a deterrence. And my question is, uh, with Iran relying much on the proxy wars, instead of uh, going confrontal confrontation, the lessons they learned from Iran-Iraqi war, and their willingness to pass these capabilities to their proxies, which will escalate and will raise tensions. It will uh, increase their rich arm to other states. And so this is a big concern now to give these such capabilities to proxies who doesn't obey to any international law. So wh where should the international community intervene or draw a red line to stop such things happening? Yeah, this is my student, by the way. My, my class is geniuses. So that's another one. Is I'm still on <laughs> Mr. Brian also. So. Yeah, who, whom did the question to? Anybody? OK, yeah. Chris. I, I, I think others should weigh in here. Because um, I, I think you absolutely um, 
identify, I think, one of the key issues, and I, I know the policy community back in D.C. is, is very well aware of, of this, uh, as are, are many regional allies, uh, particularly the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Israelis, uh, kind of in this issue of not only Iran building these kind of essentially conventional capabilities, but their willingness to proliferate them uh, to groups like the Houthis, to groups like uh, Hatib Hezbollah and others, and even to Lebanese Hezbollah uh, in some ways. Um, I don't really have a great answer of how you know, we kind of tackle that in a way, because some of it is, comes down to U.S. military interdictions, uh, you know, if we're going to go kind of a, you know, look at a, a theater like Yemen in a way. Um, but there was a great senior intelligence officer, Norm Rule, who retired as the National Intelligence Minister for Iran a couple of years ago, and I, I think his quote to the intelligence community was, was quite good. Um, you know, an IRGC officer can get into his car in downtown Tehran, and he can drive unimpeded, essentially, to the Mediterranean Sea uh, through Lebanon. Uh, that's kind of the scope of Iranian influence, in, in a way. So how do we you know, kind of reconstruct, essentially, a, you know, a, an anti-proliferation regime when the key components of that are in Iraq and, and Syria, when, essentially, there are so many questions about kind of how do we build up capacity in those locations? Uh, how do we build up, uh, you know, essentially providing technology or putting, you know, kind of individuals on the ground, uh, you know, who we trust to kind of, uh, you know, given local corruption issues and things like that, that we would trust to kind of enforce those, uh, you know, a judicial system, uh, you know, a police system, all of those things that, that we would essentially look to. Um, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, until we do, essentially, I think we are going to increasingly hear calls from our allies, particularly in the region, and I would draw back to the September 14th attack against Saudi Aramco. Um, you know, essentially, post that attack, uh, you know, the request from the U.S. government was essentially, you know, we need more air defenses. We essentially need more help. So we can take a defensive posture towards this and try to you know, prevent uh, you know, UAVs or ballistic missiles. We can try to go a little bit more on offense, and I think that's that's a balance that we're still kind of weighing in Washington. But I've deferred others. Okay. So one of the things I appreciate the question because it's for us, we draw a very distinct line, right? Like rockets and missiles are different than aircraft, manned aircraft, or even drones, as we tend to conceptualize them. But I would suggest to most non whatever, top economic tier countries, rockets and missiles are modern air power. So that's their way to conduct whatever it is we think we do through the air, that's what they use. So they are simply going to proliferate uh, because just like aircraft proliferated in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, that everybody wants to have that capability to be able to reach far beyond uh, their land force uh, reach. What, what I think is fascinating, and we have yet to see what the fallout is and how this is actually going to shape policy or not, but w with uh, one might argue that the killing of Qasem Soleimani was done uh, in connection with attacks that were either conducted or were intended to be conducted by proxy forces. And, and I'll let the panelists correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this, if it wasn't the first time, this is one of the most significant times where we've killed a state military leader for the conduct of proxy forces. Is that correct? So th now the question is, one of the things that's great about the Trump administration is it generates a lot of conversation. And so there's a lot of people debating this issue right now, and what is quite possibly going to be fascinating is what comes out of that debate with respect to actual policy. Like, are, is it going to be the policy that if Kataev Hezbollah launches another attack against America, that we're going to kill another Iranian general? Uh, and, and is that now policy? Or are we going to wait the days and days and really weeks to confirm the route, the approach on the Saudi attack before we say who it was and, and we act with this level of uh, definition. One of the things that's fascinating, particularly with the Saudi attack, and I think it bespeaks a tremendous success for Iran in their information campaign, was how quickly Iran tried to muddy the water and how easily everybody else, 
accepted the muddy water as insufficient to, to, jet or to support a response. Even though most folks, I think, initially felt that, okay, Iran had their hand in this, the waters were so muddy that everybody was like wringing their hands about, oh, well, we can't strike Iran because it's really not, we don't have enough proof. And so it's, it's, right now we have a whole lot of debates going on about what is the level of proof necessary sufficient to launch an attack on a state actor. That's part of the debate about the Suleimani killing as well. Was there sufficient proof, evidence, almost like a court case, to actually convict him? And, and what is needed to do that? And I don't, right now we don't have the answer. Israel's always operated at a different level of proof. It's sort of like the difference between beyond a reasonable doubt and uh, a propensity of the evidence, right? The 5149 argument versus, you know, it's a 90-10 kind of thing. Well, I, I don't know if America is moving toward that 5149 argument. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this administration continues to respond, because I don't think we have seen the end of uh, Iranian proxies targeting American uh, facilities. A, a couple points on your issue. First of all, what I see as the greatest proliferation threat right now is the UAVs, and as opposed to the ballistic missiles. But what makes me more concerned is that Iranians have openly bragged about how they're proliferating not only the UAVs, but the ability to manufacture them. That f goes into what Mr. Steed has said with regard to Iran's doctrine of plausible deniability. Um, now, if that extends to ballistic missiles, all the more. One of the other aspects that goes into proof is Iranian general, I mean, the, the supreme leader of Iran is a dictator, but he's a di dictator more by veto power. He tells people what they're not allowed to do rather than necessarily give the orders of what they must do. And therefore, when it comes to an issue, whether it's the Abkhaik strike or whether it's the, um, the issues which led to the 2006 conflict in Lebanon, it's natural to want to go back to signals intelligence and so forth, but you're not going to find a smoking gun the way that Iranian command structure often operates. Because people have an autonomy at the 0506 level that most other militaries in the region do not have. Um, one of the other issues with regard to ballistic missiles, and this is another issue which I disagreed with the video on, yes, the Americans under Eisenhower worked with Iran on atoms for peace as we did with the Pakistanis. The Iranians suspended their nuclear program at the time of the revolution, but it was when the Iraqis started using chemical weapons that the Iranians revived their nuclear program. Now, one of the reasons Iran, one of the interesting factoids of the Iran-Iraq war is in 1979, Mashhad, um, the largest city in northeastern Iran, was the fifth largest city in Iran total. Now it's the second largest city, and the reason was it's the only city outside of the confines, uh, outside of the range of Iraqi ballistic missiles during the War of the Cities and the Scuds going back and forth. The point of that is after having been hit by Iraqi CW, the Iranians have decided that they have to also pursue the strategy because they're not going to allow themselves to be so vulnerable again. After having hit, been hit by ballistic missiles, they have. Now, with regard to your question about what to do with it, one of the biggest debates, and this occurred uh, in the backdrop to the Joint Conference of Plan of Action, was changes in the legal language of UN Security Council Resolution, was it 2231, um, which changed the illegality from possessing ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear weapons or warheads to missiles designed to carry nuclear warheads at which point every ballistic missile became part of the satellite launch program uh, and therefore legal because what the Iranians will say is this, I mean, the fact that it can carry a nuclear warhead is besides the point. It's designed um, for satellite launches. And so one of the, from what I gather, one of the positions of the Trump administration in any sort of renegotiation is to revert this language to the status quo ante now, the Iranians appear, the Iranians are apt observers of the American political process. And they're going to wait, and I've, Iranians have told me this directly, Iranian officials, that they're going to wait until the next election to see what happens. But 
while many of the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and I say this as an analyst rather than an advocate, will say we just need to rejoin the JCPOA. Because of the sunset clauses in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which start to kick in in the year 2023, what this means is that even if you do have a Democratic president next and a desire to rejoin the Joint Conference of Plan of Action, it's going to have to be accompanied by a significant renegotiation. Otherwise, none of these issues will be addressed. Because of the, the ticking clock on the JCPOA, it's not one of these things you can simply rejoin and have everything be uh, hunky-dory. If that answers your question, thank you very much. Great question. And we can continue discussion in the class, right? So um, just to add real quick, uh, talking about the ballistic missiles, right? My understanding, and the distinguished panel will correct me, uh, Iran has uh, ballistic missiles mostly of the short and medium range kind of type. And this is between 400 and 2,000 kilometers reach. Those, most of those countries using the measurement as a kilometers, but uh, if you are interested, we can, you can transfer that to mileage. But that's what they have. In terms of the reply on two US bases, they didn't use, my understanding, the most sophisticated ballistic missiles. They used, if somebody is, uh, awa uh, uh, is aware of the former Soviet or Russian military capabilities, Shkwal type missile, which is the Soviet modernized missile, they didn't use their own more sophisticated, but the one which is Soviet modernized missile like Shkwal, Shkwal type. By the way, they did not attack Balat Air Base, which is even geographically makes more sense for those who were in Iraq. But two air bases, which is further, Ayn al-Assad and Idlib uh, US Air Base. Why they didn't attack the closest one and more densely populated one, but that's a the subject for different discussion, right? Just interesting, a lot of interesting things coming out analyzing this situation. Questions, other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Benson, United States Navy. We have kind of concern about the Strait of Hormuz. Everybody knows that the southernmost aspect of the Arabian slash Persian Gulf is the Strait of Hormuz. We know that the percentage of the world's oil that goes through there is tremendously high. We know that in the 80s they used to they uh, they began to mine it in part of the tanker war. Why have they not done that recently? And is it possible that Iran is simply a proxy of Russia and they are using that as sort of a uh, a sleeve that they're going to hold as an economic flex in, in terms of tools of power. Um, if I may, first of all, we have had incidents of limpet mines attached to, um, attached to ships, so just a technological evolution off Fujairah. And if we look back at 1987 and 1988, a lot of the mining operations actually occurred at the, um, uh, at the um, rally point, I'm forgetting the term for it, in the, in the Sea of Oman before you went in. Um, I would argue that UAVs are the new mines in the region, but the, only, the other aspect I would point out is Iran, because 80% or so of its income comes from, pet um, from petroleum products. Their fiscal year goes from March 21st to March 20th. What that means is before March 21st, when they construct their budget, they have to guesstimate what the price of oil is going to be over the next year. If the price of oil falls below that, then they can't make payroll. If it goes above that, they have a lot more money to play with. Sometimes when we see the Iranians threaten to keep the USS Harry S. Truman out of the Persian Gulf, what does that do in Lloyd's of London? I mean, in terms of insurance rates. Or if they can drop a limpet mine and attack not an American ship, but a Norwegian ship. Um, from which they don't have to worry about much consequence. What does that do to the price of oil as, uh, I mean, as they try to meet their budgetary needs? And remember, whatever the price of oil is now, when the Iranians are selling oil illegally, they have to sell it at significant discount on that. Um, and so some of this is also financial games, um, which are much more, I would say, domestically oriented. What I worry about with regard to Russia is Russia feels itself in a win-win situation. On one hand, they make a lot of money from helping Iran with its nuclear program, and that's a win. On the other hand, 
if they can drag the United States into a conflict, that's a win. And whenever the Kremlin finds itself in a win-win situation, bad things happen. That said, I'm not sure whether problems in the Strait of Hormuz are being driven from the Kremlin right now. Anything else? Like yes, Chris. A couple points on that. I, and I, I pick up on Dr. Rubin's point. Um, I think the limpet mines and the employment of those certainly still demonstrates that capability uh, from the Iranian Navy. Uh, so uh, that kind of serves the purpose, I think, for Iran on a strategic level of delivering that threat uh, to anyone who would transit those waters. Um, you know, if we kind of fall back into Iranian doctrine, though, if, if they are going back to mining, you know, both ends of the, of the Strait of Hormuz, uh, we are in a much different place strategically, uh, right? That, uh, that would almost, uh, you know, it is Iranian escalation at that point. It would invite essentially kind of a U.S. and or international counter response to that. Uh, if we kind of look back at what Iran's activities have been since, since May of, uh, of last year, and kind of at least in keeping that veneer of plausible deniability that my colleagues have spoken about, overtly mining the strait and being kind of the sole nation that, that has an interest in doing that, just kind of invites that target back to you. And the last point I would make is like, um, in a different strategic environment of where kind of oil is flowing these days, think about where most of the oil coming out of the Strait of Hormuz goes. It's to China. Um, and where does Iran's interest lie in maintaining a strategic partnership? It's both to Russia and I think to China, where I think uh, most of its petrochemical and oil sales uh, still kind of flow. So there is a, there is a risk reward in kind of escalating the conflict, I think, by, by using mines or kind of shuttering the Strait of Hormuz or even the Gulf of Oman uh, kind of uh, permanently to, to them. So. It's always important to remember during the Iran-Iraq war, Iran is perceiving that war as existential. And so it does some things that you do during existential conflicts that you don't do normally. It, even though they will use existential rhetoric now, uh, it, this is not, they are not in an existential world right now. Iran is not at the risk of, of no longer existing as an Islamic revolutionary state. And I would argue that's the simplest reason, other than the money, of why they haven't resorted to things that they did back when they really did think that the revolution might be ended. The other point I would just make is when I ask retired admirals the question, what position should the United States take? How should we deploy our forces so that the Iranians understand we're serious? To a man and woman, they will argue that if we want the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to understand that we are serious in with, with regard to our diplomatic red lines and so forth, we want to remove our carriers from the Persian Gulf. And the reason for that is the Persian Gulf is narrow and it's shallow. And when you consider, consider the disputed islands, greater and lesser tombs in Abu Musa with their territorial waters, the average, I mean, the international waterways are very, very narrow. Now, to launch an aircraft off a Nimitz class carrier takes about 26 knots of wind speed. So you have two ways to do that. You either speed up or you turn into the wind. And you can't really do that without violating territorial waters at points. And you add to that Iran's asymmetric strategy, as Mr. Steed said, of swarming us with small, small boats which developed after Operation Praying Mantis. Therefore, what you want to do is put carriers outside the Gulf, outside the Strait of Hormuz, where we have the range to hit them, but they don't have the range to hit us. And if you look right now, ever since the, ever since tensions really hit a fever point earlier this month. I've noticed when I look at the U.S. Naval Institute fleet tracker that the USS Harry S. Truman has been positioned in the northern Indian Ocean rather than in the Persian Gulf. And so as an open source analyst, that to me is something which is very, very telling. Historically, we never put carrier strike groups into the Persian Gulf until 1991. On average, between 1991, I'm getting this from the CNO, on average, between 1991 and 2003, we have one carrier strike group in the Persian Gulf. Between 2003 and 2011, we had on average two carrier strike groups in the Persian Gulf, and we're trying to reduce that to zero. Now, the problem of why we don't reduce it completely to zero is, was it Sir Harold, um, was it Harold Macmillan or Harold Wilson, uh, the British, or, um, sorry, Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary who gave the East of Suez speech in 1968, when he said the British government would no longer project power 
east of the Suez Canal. And that's when we took possession of the facilities in Bahrain and elsewhere in the Gulf. Now, most, with the exception of Qatar, most leaders in the region still remember that. So when we start talking about a pivot to Asia, what they hear through their own perspective is a pivot away from us. And so the question always in the back of people's mind, is the United States going to cut and run the way the British did? And so that adds a psychological component to how we have to reassure our GCC allies in terms of can, can we give them confidence if suddenly they stop seeing the Stennis or the Ike or the Truman in the waters, even though tactically it doesn't make much sense. Uh, is that answers your question, sir? Uh, I'm sure my, uh, the distinguished panel knows. Interesting thing about Russia, during this crisis, Russia, uh, I'm sure that you know about that, that the, Russia sent two ships to the region. Uh, that's interesting fact, because uh, one is uh, uh, the so-called Marshal Ustinov, and another one, Ivan Kuh. So one is missile carrier, and another one having the capability uh, for ra radio location to intercept the intelligence and potentially pass it to the Iranians. So just for a thought to, to think about. Um, so and we know that they're kind of partnering with Iran, etc. So other questions and comments? Yes, sir. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, Colonel Chris Cardone. I'm here in the tactics department. Um, about five years ago, I was doing a paper on Iran, the War College. And one thing that struck me was it's probably better for you as well, Dr. Ruman, to answer this when you kind of touched on already the convoluted nature of their government, how it's organized, and how decisions are made. Because uh, you follow kind of the flow chart with it, and basically, I ended up going in a circle trying to figure out how decisions are made with regard to the national interests of Iran. So if you could kind of explain that to us and give us a little context, appreciate it. Thank you. You know, when I, when I did my doctorate in Iranian history, we all used to go out on Friday nights and play a drinking game of who could name all the leaders of Iran going back 2,000 years, Ali Khamenei, Rahullah Khomeini, Mohammad Reza Shah, Reza Shah, Ahmed Shah, Mohammad Ali Shah. Believe it or not, most of us didn't get married till we were in our 30s. It wasn't as cool as we thought it was. The point of that is I talked about Iranian intellectual history. And what I would ar argue when we see that, er that convoluted chart is we have to go back to an 11th century grand vizier named Nizam al-Mulk who wrote a book called the Siyasat Nameh, the Book of Governance, which has been translated into English. And what he argued, he was basically the Persian Machiavelli. What he argued is if you want to keep control, instead of streamlining decision making and bodies, you have to duplicate them because then you can play off, you can play off um, competitors, you can leverage, they can inform on each other, they can compete with each other, and you can play games with funding. So which was the pro-Iranian militia in Iraq at the beginning of OIF? Was it the Jaysh al-Mahdi at the time, or was it the Badr Corps? And the answer is yes. Which controls the crowds? The law enforcement forces or the Basij? The answer is yes. Which conducts overseas terrorism operations? The external wing of the intelligence ministry or the Quds Force? And the answer is yes. And so when I look at that convoluted nature, I look at that traditional Persian kingship combined with a desire for plausible deniability. I see Khomeini first and then Khamenei as a master marionette. And whenever one group gets too big for its britches, he cuts them down and shifts power to another one. One of the reasons I don't believe Rouhani is a moderate is under Ahmadinejad, the fascinating thing about the former president Ahmadinejad is he came from a Revolutionary Guard background and so we looked at him into the window into the mindset of the IRGC to some extent. And at one point, you only had one minister in the cabinet of the Islamic Republic who was a cleric, who also was sort of like the chaplain to the IRGC. And it became a bit of a constitutional crisis. Now, and you had more people who were members of governors, deputy governors, ministers, deputy ministers, members of parliament who had IRGC backgrounds. Rouhani came in and he cut a lot of these guys loose, but he didn't replace them with liberals. I mean, again, this is where mirror imaging comes in, but rather with veterans of the intelligence ministry. And it's sort of writing that natural balance in order to allow Khamenei to keep control. <laughs>
it answers your question, sir. Anything else? Well, I, I, I just love the question because it gets to this notion of mirror imaging. Now, obviously, even in America, we have a rather convoluted process. Uh, but regularly, you will hear on both sides of our political spectrum this emphasis on uh, efficiency. And we want efficient delivery of governance. Uh, whether we do it or not is, is another issue. But, but we talk that way. And that is rarely heard in the Middle East at all. Very few people, even if they talk, m nobody really believes that efficiency is what matters. OK, great, great discussion. Everybody enjoying so far? Is it absolu absolutely nonsense or something useful? OK, good. Uh, I want to pause for a minute and give the opportunity to the outstations that they can ask their questions and comments. Please be, don't be shy. You know, you can see me and us. We are not shy at all, right? So please ask your question. At, this is the time. Or make a comment. Yeah, hey. hey, sir. This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Lodzi. I'm a uh, civil affairs officer in the First Army, and uh, I have done a couple of deployments to uh, Persian-speaking uh, countries, um, and I've studied around for, for quite some time now. Um, and I would appreciate a challenge from the panel to my pessimism here, um, but I don't see a mechanism for an Iran-initiated conflict resolution when we, uh, when you peel back the layers of our relationship with that state, um, it, they have so many, you know, historic and recent reasons for Iran to resent us when we support an extremely unpopular Shah. We enable Saddam to guess them in their only conventional modern war. And then after they filled the, the power vacuum in Iraq and realigned the leadership in Baghdad to the Shia, we go and support the Kurds so heavily that they have a reasonable argument for an autonomous Kurdistan from Syria to Turkey to Iran and the sanctions and the sanctions and the sanctions with so much for an Iranian, um, either an official or, or just an every, anybody, to bitterly resent in the relationship with the U.S. I mean, what moves us towards reconciliation? I really see that only coming from our side because I don't see the incentive um, coming from them, even under you know a perceived moderate Rouhani, which uh, was just you know debunked by your panel there. Thank you, sir, very much. Anybody want to come well, in? I, yes, I, I, I just want to start because I know uh, other folks can get into more detail, but. Uh, one of the things I, I find interesting about uh, this notion in general is, uh, I, so most everybody here is military, so we'll talk about this from military sense. Uh, you guys spend the entirety of your career, or almost the entirety of your career, every time you do an exercise uh, or a planning drill or you actually uh, you do a simulation or you go to a combat training center, fighting an enemy that's diametrically opposed to your will. We set the situations up that way. You're right now training and planning a scenario where you're trying to go north and the enemy wants to stop you from going north. And what I would suggest is that creates in us over the course of 20, 30, for some of you, 40 years, I'm sure you hope, um, uh, this sense that if we declare somebody an opponent, that they must be or we must place ourselves in opposition to what they want. If they want to go in a direction, we must interpose ourselves between them and whatever their goal is. Uh, and one of the things I would suggest with respect to Iran is even if we are never friends or we're never, you know, good buddies uh, like Buzz and Woody, I mean, the, the point is all we have to get is that we're not fighting over the toys in the playroom, right? Like we don't have to... Anyway, I'll stop with the Toy Story analogy. But just because, just because Iran wants to do something does not mean we have to oppose it. And, and if we can get Iran to think vice versa, then that might be all we need. So the, I, I think sometimes this notion that we're all going to be peaceful and friendly is, is rather an American approach and not necessary to improving the environment within the region. Um. I would add a little bit to this in that the, I think the United States is very bad at the influence and information opportun um, strategies. Uh, 
For example, while 1953 is repeatedly brought up, a lot of people forget that the United States and Britain, along with the Soviet Union, occupied portions of Iran just a decade before, and we often don't talk about that formal occupation as being the source of grievance. When it comes to 1953, while we refer to it as a coup today, at the time it was referred to as a counter coup, and the reason was because Mossadegh wasn't the constitutional leader of Iran. Now, if you look at the diction of the day, people talked about the conflict between the Reds and the Blacks. The Reds were those who were left-leaning, including uh, Prime Minister Mohammed Mossadegh, who refused to step down when his government was dismissed. And there was, this was against the backdrop of the Cold War and so forth. The Blacks were those who wore turbans, um, the conservatives. And so you had the conservative clergy who were um, allied with the royalists, who were allied with the Iranian military, the US and the British. Fast forward 50 years, when Madeleine Albright as Secretary of State apologized to the Iranians in 2000 for the coup, or the counter coup, their response was fine, you finally admitted guilt, let's talk about reparations. This, was, this whole grievance sort of industry uh, and how it plays into Iran and North Korea was the subject of um, one of the books, Dancing with the Devil, which if you order on Amazon and get a vampire romance, that's the wrong book. Um, but one of the issues is when it comes to this sort of grievance, we've got to be very cognizant. During the run-up to the Joint Conference of Plan of Action, there was an incident in which the Iranians complained bitterly we referred to carrots and sticks. And the Iranians complained that this showed that the Americans were racist. Because after all, what's the genesis of the term carrots and sticks? It's with donkeys. You either reward them with carrots or you beat them with sticks. Therefore, we were referring to Iranians as donkeys. And therefore, in order to show that we weren't racist, we had to give greater uh, sort of concessions. Well, if you looked in Persian at the phrase carrots and sticks, it's used all the time in Persian political rhetoric. So we've got to be where, I mean, we've got to be cognizant of how we think that we're conscious of others' culture. We have to be cognizant of how they play our culture and our, our, our unease with being accused of anything uh, which leads to grievance. That said, what I worry about, and this is where I would segue with the, with the, um, the first army questioner, is when it comes to maximum pressure, on one hand, historically, I think maximum pressure can work. On the other hand, when I look at the case of Iraq, a lot of people forget that historically, Iraq was, long, up until the 1970s, considered the least corrupt Arab country. When I went f to Iraq for the first time in 2000, the joke on the street was, how do you tell an, Iraq, an honest Iraqi general? He's the one driving a taxi cab because he didn't embezzle money in his military capacity. The point of this is that um, years of war and sanctions undercut the Iraqi economy to the point that once Iraq became our allies, we've struggled for two decades almost to rebuild it. And I wouldn't want to get into a situation where we do that with regard to Iran. I would say that while I recognize anti-Americanism in Iran, what I would see as the historical root of anti-Americanism in Iran wasn't 1953, but it was in the 1960s when you had diplomatic immunities extended to Americans who were working for private companies in Iran, Bell Helicopters, Pepsi-Cola, and so forth. And when you talk to Iranians of that generation, they will all tell stories about how a family member was killed, for example, by a drunk driver. And they couldn't prosecute the drunk driver because he was American and had immunities. And this, I would say, by osmosis, segues into some of the debates we had at the end of the Bush era and the beginning of the Obama presidency with regard to a status agreement with Iraq and the idea of whether American forces would have immunities. Because from the pro-Iranian perspective, that historically, I would argue, has always been the key, even if popular perception doesn't recognize as such today. Yeah, and there's only two things. And I, I actually agree with the premise that the, that the questioner kind of lays out, uh, in part because I, approaching this from an Iranian mindset, they are the aggrieved party. Uh, we walked away from JCPOA. We have applied maximum pressure. Uh, we killed Qasem Soleimani. So as the aggrieved party in their culture, 
uh, we should be the ones to kind of allow them to save face, you know, provide a conduit to, to get back to a, a negotiation, or we are the ones that should provide that concession up front to, to bring them to the table. And I think the challenge right now, um, at least in kind of how the Iranians are struggling to understand us, and, and, and particularly this administration, uh, is what do we have that they want? You know, what, what is the commonality that could bring us, uh, you know, to negotiation? And we, you know, to them, it's it's all about sanctions relief right now it, because it's not an existential crisis yet for the Iranians. Um, they feel that they can kind of contain, uh, you know, any kind of uh, hints of kind of internal unrest. Uh, they can still exercise influence in the region. Uh, you know, they're not at that point where we're talking about the the, the crumbling of the regime yet. Maybe if you get at that point, um, you know, that would drive them to the negotiating table. That would allow them to kind of take the initiative in that. But I just don't see that the constellation of political figures uh, there who are willing to reach out to the United States. Um, and all that being said, you know, Hamane has pr strictly forbid that as well. That being said, there are some issues where we probably have common cause with the Iranians. Uh, Anti-ISIS. You know, no one wants to see that group, uh, you know, kind of resurge in, in the region. Uh, Long-term stability in Afghanistan. We talked with them before in 2001 in the bond process. Could we get back to something like that? Uh, Counter-narcotics, uh, long been floated as an issue that we could kind of, uh, kind of talk to them. Uh, the consular di dialogue, which you know, uh, resulted in the release of at least one U.S. detainee, Ji Wang, uh, at a Princeton University in early December in exchange for uh, you know, an Iranian uh, uh, arrested here in the United States. Some tactical things I think you could at least start to build a dialogue. Getting to that strategic level, I, as Dr. Rubin said, I think the Iranians are very content to wait until November 2020 to see what happens in our election and then make a choice then. Mr. Steve? No. Sure, is that answers your question? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And, You're welcome. Uh, hope to see other, you all other, in other the questions Embassy or comments from the outstation? Yes, sir, you had something to say, sir? No, I appreciate the, uh, the panel response. Thank you. You're welcome. Other outstations, questions, comments? Okay. Yes, Dr. Hernandez, please. We ne we'll have to wrap up very soon. Uh, also, oh, is this working? Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm Dr. Hernandez. I uh, work here as a member of CASO as well and read the degree programs. And I was struck by the last question from First Army, and I, I would like to uh, continue along those lines. Um, I'm also a veteran of deployments to, uh, to Afghanistan, so uh, I, I've been in that region. And my, my point is, to those powers in the region, uh, these conflicts are existential. I don't think that for us, the United States, these conflicts are existential, and yet, we continue to dig our heels in, in the region, uh, ignoring history and culture to a large extent. Uh, the results that I've seen and experienced in both Iraq and Afghanistan are not what we expected. And now we're gonna take on uh, a bigger adversary, uh, apparently. So my question is, uh, since you, uh, have, you, know, you touch the, uh, the policy community, all of you, uh, what gives? You know, why do we frame Iran as an enemy, uh, and we accuse them of being so so uh, uh, repressive? And then we are allies with Saudi Arabia, which arguably are equally repressive or more. And, and we take sides in something that we should be uh, two steps away from. Uh, and then we violate international law uh, in various ways. Uh, we step away from all international agreements. And we expect things to go our way. I mean, uh, and on top of ignore, ignoring culture and, and history, uh, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, uh, since you touched the policy community, what, what kinds of answers do you have to these questions? Anybody? Uh, yeah, the easy question. Um, no, I, 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 do, I do appreciate it. I, I think it comes to the crux. I will give an imperfect answer because I, you know, I represent the... Uh, Analytic community of, of, among the intelligence community. I, you know, um, sometimes, uh, you know, you know, uh, I, I would readily concede that. Uh, and but under various administrations that I've worked with over the course of my career, um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to. You know, I think Martin Indyk in the Wall, Wall Street Journal had a, a good piece in the last couple of days where he talked about essentially what are U.S. strategic interests in the Middle East right now. 
and, and he really didn't have a good question. He's served much longer on, on some of these issues than I have. Uh, is it Middle East peace? Um, is it counter Iran? Uh, one would argue that's been the most consistent, at least in the course of the, the, the current administration. Um, is it stability in places like Iraq? Is it solving you know, conflicts in, in Syria or, or Yemen? Um, you know, I think we ha need to figure that out and articulate that to a degree. Um, you know, and I know the policy community back home is, is, is working on some of those things. Uh, you know, we persistently kind of uh, you know, produce strategies and things like that. But it's not to a point of definition, and I think I would lean on others, where you know, we have a credibility gap, I think, when we look at governments like the Saudis, like the Israelis, like the Turks, and others who question our long-term commitments there, uh, our military commitment, our diplomatic commitment, our economic commitment. Um, so I would, I would just say it's kind of... It, that uncertainty, and until you can close the gap on that uncertainty, it, it does kind of leave you with more kind of strategic unanswered questions than answered. Uh, but I happily defer to others. I, I rea oh, yes. No. Dr. Rubin, Mr. Seed. Okay. You would whisper to me a threat if I tried to answer any part of that question. <laughs> Sorry. You uh, disclosed the secret. <laughs> yeah. So I realized I just we cut accidentally one of the outstay. I, I want to give a ch another last chance, if you don't mind, to the outstation which was trying to answer, ask the question or make a comment. Sir, outstations, they changed their mind. OK, we gave the chance. So anything else? OK, now is the time to conclude our session, right? Um, and uh, next slide, please. So this is the reading list, Castle reading list. We expect that you, ca you would read all these resources in about one week. Just kidding. So uh, it's going to be part of the slide deck which will be posted on our website, Castle website, OK? If you are interested, you can access any of this. And the next slide, the most recent uh, uh, literature related to the situation, the region, and etc. Right. So this is for your information. Next slide, please. So the final slide contains our contact information for any related questions. These are the links to Castle website. On behalf of all of us, we would like to thank our great panel for sharing their great expertise. This concludes the session, just for your situational awareness. Our next panel on April the 16th, we are analyzing the operational environment, and we will come up with another topic, which would be very important at that time. We, I think we already have some I good ideas about the topic. So April 16th in this room. Thank you so much for your participation. <laughs>